hi everyone. So my name is Michael and uh, this is a session about uh, secure software supply chain. And uh, I will cover the kind of basic concepts uh, of uh, how secure software supply chain works, uh, some of the history and uh, what we do there on the operating system level. And with me, I also have Stacy, uh, and uh, she will talk more, more about the management part of uh, what we do on the secure software supply chain and uh, what two tools do we have there. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask uh, during the session or at the end we will have some space and those who will have like good questions and every question is good. They can get a nice t-shirt. So write those down, prepare the questions and uh, you will have a chance to, to get your answers as well, hopefully. All right, so supply chain, what exactly it is and why we are talking about it. So the supply chain attacks uh, have been recorded uh, fairly recently only. So there is an European agency, which is called ENISA, which uh, has been doing uh, monitoring of these supply chain attacks uh, since 2021. And uh, you can see on the picture that the amount of these attacks has been on the rise. So in 2020, actually 2020 was the start when it started to monitor these attacks. So it got like four of them in 2020 or four, four to eight. And then it uh, raised to four times that amount in 2021 and is on a, has been on the rise since then. And since this, uh, I mean, this is not a new problem, but only recently it uh, was, uh, it's something what people started to, to pay attention to. And uh, supply chain attacks have also been something what became easier as the resources to run these attacks are getting more and more uh, available. It used to require like state nations to, to run these attacks, but uh, lately it's uh, so easier it's way easier so that even like small groups or even individuals can, can pull off these, these attacks. So be aware of those and uh, prepare for, for them because it's something was given, was not going to go away. One of the first, actually the most famous attack which started all this was the SolarWinds hack. So it's a company which has been working on the, which has uh, a software for infrastructure monitoring and network monitoring. And uh, that, that software has been in use by many customers, including government agencies worldwide. And uh, this, the software is called Orion. And uh, sometime in early 2020, a group of hackers injected a malicious code into, into that software. So they broke in to the company uh, tools and uh, premises and injected malicious code to the source code of their Orion software. And the SolarWinds didn't know about that hack back then. So being unaware, they actually spread that hack to their customers and at the end exposed their customers' environments to, the, to these hackers. So it was pretty serious. It affected a lot of companies. And uh, this was one of the first attacks which popularized this supply chain, uh, supply chain security needs and attacks and uh, made like most population aware of their, their existence. So what's supply chain, what's a secure supply chain? So we talk about uh, uh, supply chain security and the definition is about securing, documenting and tracing. So you know, not, it's, not, it's not about security itself, it's also about the option, uh, the possibilities to document and trace the, all the details regarding sources binaries, dependencies, updates, and uh, all of that regarding the specific workload. And for each workload you are running, you should be able to, to document and trace all these details. And uh, not only upon its initial deployment, but also throughout its, its life cycle. Because the application is deployed and when it's running, it's being updated. And uh, throughout this, this life cycle, at each of these times, it can get, uh, get attacked and exposed to, to something uh, malicious. And why do we care? It's easy, I've, as I've said, the number of attacks has been increasing, but also there are other aspects uh, you should keep in mind because uh, software nowadays, it's not only data centers, right? So you get software in cars, 
you get software in appliances, you get software in whatever you can think of, and each of these uh, software components is uh, a possible target for these uh, supply chain attacks. And you probably don't want to sit in a car which suddenly gets, gets a malicious code injected because somebody forgot to verify one of the dependencies because these cases can become pretty harmful at the end. And the other reason why we should think about supply chain attacks is uh, are actually human errors because uh, social engineering is, is a thing nowadays. It's actually easy to get hold of uh, like contacts within a specific company and convince those contacts to like uh, somehow uh, get some parts of a code replaced by something malicious or put a USB stick somewhere and uh, get the environment infected. So these are the reasons why supply chain security is, uh, is important. Supply chain, as you know, is a chain, meaning uh, it's as weak as its uh, weakest link. So we need to take care that all of the links in that chain are actually secure. So from the start to the end, you need to take care of all the, all the components of that chain. So there are different threads uh, which apply to different parts of the chain. You probably can't read it, but this picture illustrates the life cycle of a, of a piece of software. So it starts with development, uh, which creates some source code. The source code gets built, packaged and distributed to the consumer. And uh, in the build process and in the development process, it's consuming some dependencies from the outside. And there are multiple threads uh, which can target different parts of this, of this process, meaning source code threads. You can get uh, like uh, malicious code in the source code. You can get compromised uh, source code versioning system. You can get build threads, meaning uh, some source code gets injected in the build process, which uh, was not controlled by the source code control system. You can get uh, like compromised packages used during the build process. You can get uh, like bad packages. So you expect some packages being used, but at the end those packages uh, might be compromised already. And you can uh, have dependency threads. And that's something what many people do, do not realize today. And uh, actually they are fine if you are developing application, uh, they are fine getting their dependencies from, from a public repository. So if you are de developing in Python, you can get PyPy packages, uh, same applies to Node.js, Go, Rust, all these programming languages have their ecosystems publicly available. And obviously uh, not all of these dependencies are strictly monitored for, for malicious code. So this is one of the frequent reasons uh, when and how malicious code uh, can get to the, to the application. And that applies also to not only uh, source code uh, attacks, but also nowadays uh, with containers become, which became very popular, uh, people are, or developers are uh, very used to just grab their dependencies from repositories like Docker Hub. And like half of the Docker Hub is not maintained for like uh, people just injected their uh, containers there and left them running and uh, others are happily consuming these uh, containers despite uh, having the security holes. So that's another uh, point of view, you need to keep an eye on what you are consuming from the outside. And uh, while it's way easier for developers to just grab stuff from, from third party repositories, be aware that uh, you better take care of uh, what's being consumed. So you had a question, yeah, perfect. Uh, two questions, so on this space, I think you kind of answered it, uh, giving the examples of Docker. One more thing is, uh, for example, let's say, I know what I'm submitting, like there is like a lot of packages av available in the browser. Uh, which we actually works with. Uh, so do you think uh, we can avoid this space by having a proper coverage like mechanism or saying that, uh, hey, uh, these are the packages that are being used, that are being in the project, these are the users, like whatever comes beyond that, you need to go through certain, let's say, checks. Only if somebody approves it, you need to go through these checks. So can we avoid, can we have such a process so that we can ensure that we can avoid this space? That is the first question. Uh, on the dependency threads, uh, what, according to you, is important uh, in order to get a dependency? Because some people completely rely on the SDK uh, to get the dependencies. Some completely depend on their, uh, let's say, their performance of XML or the setup of the UI file, uh, whatever the context which uh, the author of that particular application is supposed to have given them. 
So uh, what is more important? So great question. And uh, I will actually cover some of these uh, parts in my, in my next slide throughout the presentation. But uh, the simple answer is you need to make sure that uh, the, s the source where you are getting your software from is secure. And that can mean multiple things. So ideally, you have a trusted vendor who is providing these, these packages to you and uh, they are doing the audits. Or you can have your own team which is doing the audits on, on the packages you are consuming. So you can do it yourself, you can have a vendor, but you need to have kind of a process in place to make sure that there is uh, no third party, third party like interfering with the code you are actually consuming. So let me carry on with the presentation. I think it will answer some of these questions. If not, just raise those again and I will, I will carry on, I will answer. Thank you. All right, so that's actually what I want to talk about right now. How, what are the ways how to, uh, how to prevent uh, secure soft, how to prevent supply chain attacks uh, using some of these methods. So security is about like multiple targets and uh, I'm going to into detail here. So the primary targets are uh, confidentiality, uh, meaning that information is exposed only to those who are, or who should be able to access that information. Uh, the other target is integrity, so that information is not uh, changed or altered uh, on the way to the, to the target consumer. And obviously availability, meaning that uh, when the target consumer needs that information, it's readily available and uh, ideally not uh, at other times uh, for security purposes. And uh, there are multiple uh, ways how to make sure that security uh, that these targets uh, are applied to the software's uh, supply chain uh, processes and tools. And uh, one of the uh, recent methodologies is called SALSA. It's a Google's uh, specification and also kind of a certification of supply chain security. And uh, it specifies uh, how to address some of, these, uh, some of these threats, how to avoid them actually, and uh, how to make sure that your supply chain is secure. And it mandates uh, some, some measures. So if you want to have your supply chain uh, deliver, delivery certified, uh, you know what are the measures you need to apply. So for instance, for a source code, it mandates like uh, two person review. So upon any uh, code commit, uh, there needs to be like two people there that uh, review those specific commits. And uh, the other source code related is uh, version control system. So there are measures like about the, the machine security when the, co where the control system is running. There are measures uh, how the control system should be set up. And uh, that applies to the other parts of, uh, of to the other threads as well. So build threads, for instance, uh, SALSA mandates uh, control build environment. So the built environment needs to be kind of self-contained. So we can imagine a VM which gets spawned, the, the stuff gets built within that VM without any, any like outside uh, influence. So the build process cannot just fetch random stuff from GitHub. The build process cannot fetch random Python modules. All of these modules need to be predefined available within the VM so that the result is, is defined and uh, ideally the build is reproducible. That obviously can uh, conflict with what developers, uh, some of the developers do today, because a lot of these processes, build processes are dynamic. They rely on, on GitHub repositories. During the build process, they, they fetch the stuff from the internet. Well, it's convenient, but it can be risky. So it's always like a trade-off uh, between convenience and, uh, and uh, assurance and, and security. And the other related topic is, is provenance of pretty much all the data which are related to the build processes. So uh, meaning uh, if it should be locked, uh, what's, what's being used for the build process, how the build process is running, where are the, like what, uh, what arguments have been used and uh, all of that is available not only during the build process, but also after the build process. So that whoever is consuming the outcome of a build can independently verify later on how the build process went, uh, what was used, and if there's uh, nothing which is, uh, which is wrong or, or insecure. And obviously security measures for the build machine and the, the build VM are, are important as well. Yes, please. Do, do you do um, the security um, checking? Um, 
during the build process only, or do you do it at some some later point um, in time um, also? So that's a good question. You can do security checks at any time uh, appropriate or, or what fits you. It's uh, important to make sure that there are checks in place. So for the build process itself, uh, the important aspect is that it's uh, reproducible and it uh, works with a well-known source code and data and packages and input, right? And if you check this beforehand, uh, then you are fine as well because then during the build process, if, if the environment is con like confined and uh, limited, then nothing uh, can be introduced during the build process because you, you work with a known, known input yeah. and the output is deterministic, right? But you can obviously run build checks and security uh, checks. Yeah, within. What I mean is um, um, some build can be okay at build time and in some later point in time, um, some of the lists you are pulling in, let's say you use um, Hibernate or whatever um, from, the, from the internet, um, can have, or, or a security flaw can be known um, at some later point in time. So how do you um, find these um, kind of dependencies who cannot uh, detect um, at, at um, a build time? So the important uh, thing to keep in mind is that this is kind of a repeated process. So at the time of the build, you, what I've been describing right now is that you are making sure that the security uh, aspects are met at the time of the build. But the next day or next hour even, there can be a security issue found in one of the libraries used in like third party libraries in your own code and you need to react somehow. And uh, you just repeat the build and you either fix the bug yourself or you get a fixed third party dependency or you remove a dependency and repeat the build and get a secure outcome again. But this is really over and over and over repeated process. So, so the idea is to, to have a continuous Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah. Not only um, for um, your nightlies, but only for, uh, also for your stable releases, right? Yes, exactly. That's how, it's, mm, how it probably has to work nowadays. Right. I know it's like... No, um, it sounds <laughs> a little bit, um, yeah, you need to get um, used to it. Yes. Um, but I, yeah, I absolutely um, get your point. Um, so that's the reality today. We need to be able to break fast. Unfortunately, the threats are coming on a like, hourly, daily basis, and we need to be able to, to react and, and respond. You can limit what, uh, you, you can limit the exposure. So you can have the application contained in a, like, a VM, in a container. You can have a controlled environment. So you can be relaxed a little bit. But uh, then, obviously, eventually you need to update that application or its dependencies somehow. And there are measures how to update the application in place. So, like, we do have stuff which is called li uh, live patching. So you can update applications while running so that the performance and uh, functionality is not affected. But uh, sometimes it can be used, sometimes it can't. So it really depends. Thanks a lot. And uh, thank you for your question. Regarding dependencies, uh, that's uh, actually what I've already mentioned, but a lot of these things which uh, apply to source code and, and uh, build threads apply to the dependency threads. So you need uh, to keep the provenance of the data there so in case you get a like, third party library. Uh, you want to know what version it was, uh, what it contained, what files it, it has, and then uh, how it was used for the build and uh, be able to check and uh, check that later when you are building the stuff or when you are ver verifying that uh, the application was secure, secure beforehand. And obviously you want to check your dependencies. I will probably be repeating that uh, because it's what, uh, despite being annoying part of the process, needs to be happening, right? So this is uh, a picture of what we actually do as part of a building our operating systems less. So we, we work with the community code and uh, then take the code through this process up to the customer systems. So we work with the community and uh, we make sure that the community development process is sane. So like generally communities are trustworthy. So we upstream uh, at least those lively ones. They have uh, like a regular review, they have multiple maintainers and uh, we are part of a maintainers uh, group as well. So we make sure that the upstream code is, is uh, safe. But then we also need to make sure 
but throughout the process, be before it gets to the customer, it's all verified and, uh, and secure. So there is a code review before it gets uh, injected into our build, build service. Then uh, there is a package selection, meaning like how, uh, which components are selected for that specific package build. Then there is a build process and we are using the open build service tool for that, which does exactly this confinement. So each, each build has its own VM. It has its, all its sources, source packages and, and dependencies in it. So it's reproducible. It runs without any third party interaction and without any ex internet exposure. So we know that whatever was in there is also getting into the, into the output. And uh, there is nothing like what, what can interfere with the outcome. That gets tested, and uh, the, this testing can be also security testing, but in general it's like functionality testing, and then uh, all this is signed and delivered, and uh, then customers can, can consume it. So the packages are signed, the repositories are signed, and this way uh, the, customers, uh, the customer who is installing that specific package can be sure that during this build chain, this build process, nothing has interfered with, the, with that code, and he's kind of safe to run it. But as you said, next day there can be a security issue somewhere. So, well, we need to rebuild the package and we actually do it. So some packages are rebuilt pretty often and uh, each build is going through that process from the left to the right and the updated package can be available like in an hour. And then obviously all the application developers need to grab that updated package and install it again. All right. Yes, please. tool or keep holding uh, any uh, <coughs> get the training template so that uh, you can just uh, ask it to execution or you want the build to happen to automatically when you get the build you know, testing and second uh, so how does uh, this get it signed for you what is the mechanism in which it happens and can this the signature is valid or does it do like uh, I, what I understand is it's valid only for this build and next time when you build it I just so let me answer a second uh, question first. So the signature is valid for, for everything what we release. So we actually, we have a like signing key, which we use to sign all the packages. We have a signing key, which we use to sign the repositories. And you can verify if you download the package from, from SUSE repository, that you can easily verify that it's actually coming from us. It's like the usual, usual signing mechanisms uh, which are used. So you just verify it the ways uh, the same way you are used to verify stuff. So that's actually pretty straightforward. When it comes to the build processes within the company, I mean, it's, it's tricky obviously because it's a trade off between effort and security and like uh, how much time you spend on, on securing your, your environment. And it really depends how much sensitive information you are processing, how uh, security aware or, or risky environments uh, uh, you are running or you have inside your company. So some companies uh, are more security conscious or aware because they are running like processing customer data uh, in some of the departments and uh, in some some pieces, in some parts can be easier. Like if you have like POCs, open source developers, those probably do not need to be that, uh, that aware. On the other hand, you need to make sure that the overall infrastructure is not uh, exposed to, to attacks. So it's fine to have open source developers grab stuff from GitHub and develop their applications, as long as if this development process is not injected, I injecting the like malicious code into your production environment. So this kind of separation can help. The other aspect can be that uh, you actually have a like team which takes care of uh, the basic building blocks. So we do have some customers like in, in telcos, which uh, have dedicated team to the operating system and its components, and they prepare repositories for the development teams. And in some of these industries, you are actually mandated even by law 
that you can't just grab random stuff and, and develop with it. And uh, so this team takes care of all these dependencies. So they have a, like a operating system, they have a Python, Python interpreter, they have a set of, I don't know, 300, 1000 Python modules ready available to the development teams. And these teams need to use only these modules to develop their application. If they need another module, they go to the team and the team goes to the vendor, they talk to us and we kind of provide these because this is really like com contained uh, environment and uh, they can't afford, uh, they are not even allowed to use like random unsigned or insecure things. We need to have guarantees and support for, for many years for these components. So uh, that's a good question. Somebody asked me the other day about uh, SBOM as well. I don't have uh, full details. What I can tell you is that we are exposing the complete source code uh, with all the build flags uh, to actually publicly. We are, we are only doing open source. As, as part of our products, we are exposing uh, everything what we use to build stuff. So if you install a package, like from the latest version, I pick like slash 15 SP4. If you install bash package, you can go to sources.suze.com and look for, for this specific package and specific build. And you will see the source code from upstream. You will see the spec file. You will see the patches which are applied. That, and the spec file will obviously contain all the details about the flags which have been used and the patches which have been applied. So that's how you can, you can actually build it yourself at the end using the source code and verify that uh, what we are uh, distributing is like the same pending the signature because you won't be able to sign it using the SUSE internal key. And one more question, yes, please. Yeah. You are saying about alpha compliance in this picture and I hope it's not too internal, but what is this alpha level? You are talking here about this is a like small alpha level, right? So Jeff, do you happen to know what level is that? Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, yeah. So Salsa is fairly new thing. So Google used their own specification to come up with Salsa levels, and uh, we've been uh, actually certifying against Salsa just just recently. So that's what we do. And speaking of certifications, there are more of them. So Salsa is a recent one, and uh, the one which can be used right away for software supply chain uh, security. There are more of those and I'm not going through the details because there are like different bodies, different certifications and different, uh, different purposes. And I like actually uh, this table more because it illustrates what kind of certification are there. And this is by no means exhaustive list. There are many of those uh, available, but these are the main ones which we are facing when we are talking to our customers. So common criteria is actually my favorite one because it's pretty complex. It covers the complete environment. So it's not about, it's not only about the software itself, not, not only about the software components, but also about the processes uh, which are used to build the software. It's about the processes which, which are within the company used to decide about new features, about communication within the company. It's about the IT environment, how the servers are set up. It's about the physical environment, how the offices are used so that they, they check the stuff that you can't enter the premises without being authorized. And they're actually, uh, these offices are going to those offices, checking the environment that you are uh, really secure. So that's pretty complex. Uh, and there are multiple versions of common criteria certifications. The other one, which is mostly used in, in the US is FIPS. It's about crypto algorithms uh, and uh, random generators. It defines uh, which crypto algorithms are secure enough and which can be used. And uh, STIC is about documenting uh, how to make a system secure. So these are sets of uh, security guidelines, which you should apply when you are setting up a system and configuring the, the workload. And there are a bunch of other certifications, PCI DSS for financial data. So you need to figure out which ones apply. Like some are mandated by law if you are processing 
financial information or customer data, PCI DSS might be already something what uh, you need to adhere to. Others are voluntary, but you should keep looking for vendors who are uh, certified against these certifications because it also improvements the overall uh, supply chain security processes and environment. Common criteria, as I, as I explained, is the most complete when it comes to the, to the topic. There are multiple levels, again, from one to, I don't know, seven. Uh, the most, the biggest level reachable for the regular operating system, general operating system, is level four, because up uh, to level four, it's about the software and processes, how it's built, uh, what components are used. If you go to level five and above, it requires, for, uh, requires formal specification of algorithms used in the software and that can't be really done for Linux nowadays. So there are specific specialized operating systems which carries these uh, higher levels of uh, common criteria certifications. We do have EEL uh, uh, evaluation assurance level four and we actually have four plus. Plus means that there is a formal specification of the processes related to uh, to remediation of a security flaws. So if there is a security issue, then uh, it's defined and prescribed what the process is like, who reacts, how, re how they react, uh, what do they do? So it's something what you actually ask for. So this process is well defined in the, in the security certification criteria. We have to have a documentation. We have to have follow these processes to make sure whenever there is a security issue, that uh, this timeline is followed in, in every case and updated package, updated component is released to the customers in a timely manner. So that's, uh, the, uh, I like this certification because it actually is something useful, unlike some of the others. It shows that the environment of a, of a vendor is actually really secure according to, to the certification body. And common criteria is uh, used worldwide. So there are some, some countries which have authorities uh, issuing uh, the certification, other countries do accept the certificates, so it's a uh, pretty, pretty useful certification. And uh, as I explained, for some industries, uh, different certifications might be relevant, like uh, FIPS is relevant uh, for the government agencies, obviously, specifically in the US, they are mandated to, to use uh, FIPS certified processes and uh, other industries can use these certifications uh, as they see fit. So really look for the vendors uh, based on what your company actually does. And uh, this is the picture I showed before. It's just to reiterate the fact that the certifications should apply to the complete process. So if I will be just certifying the delivery chain, the delivery part of a, of a chain, that's really not very useful because uh, the rest needs to be secure as well. So our uh, certification is applicable or applies to the complete chain, uh, how we deliver software to our customers uh, from the community code through all the development, building, testing, signing steps. And uh, you can obviously do something similar with your software. When you are developing, you can also uh, look into these uh, certifications, how they, are, how they are done. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's Any over to? Stacy, to okay. talk about what this. Any more questions right now? I think I can figure this out. I can give you mine. I think I got that better. Actually, no, I'm good. I'm good. I think I got it. Okay, can you hear me? No? Can you hear me? Okay. All right, so now that you have this great software implemented and secure and it's in your system, how do you keep it secure? Well, you need to patch it. So I have a question for you. How many of you have a defined patching schedule that you use on a regular basis and you know your systems are secure? One, two. Okay. She gets a t-shirt. You already have one. All right, so unpatched systems cause more than 60% of software secure cyber attacks. And sometimes your CIOs and your CSOs 
are actually going against you because they don't want their system going down. And 56% of attacks are coming from vulnerabilities that are more than four years old. That means that these systems have not been patched. That's a problem. So patch management is important because it fixes the vulnerabilities and it decreases cyber attacks. It also is a proven, a way that you can prove that you're compliant. So for PCI, for example, you need to show that you're patching your systems on a regular basis. And of course, patching goes beyond software fixes. It makes sure that your systems are the best for your users. So how are you managing your infrastructure? Some more numbers. $33.6 million is the annual cost of downtime due to cyber attacks. That's a lot of money, and you don't want to be responsible for it. Cyber attacks globally, the price is going up, $4.4 million per cyber attack. And the average annual hourly cost for cyber attacks, $400,000. This is coming from a Gartner report. So SUSE offers a product called SUSE Manager. SUSE Manager is the only IT infrastructure management tool that manages and secures non-SUSE infrastructure. So if you're running SLUS, our product, you're running Red Hat, you're running Ubuntu, Debian, you can secure it from a single console with SUSE Manager. We scale with our hub architecture from 10 clients to up to a million clients. And you can prove through reporting and dashboarding that you're keeping your entire mixed Linux environment secure, healthy, and current. And we allow scheduling and automation through SALT and those Ansible playbooks that you've got sitting around, you can import those into SUSE Manager. And with our last release of SUSE Manager, these are the, the distributions that we support. So everything from our SLES 12 and 15, through our SLE micro product, and even the new Alma and Rocky Linux, that is the CentOS clones that are out there, you can support it. And we have customers that are using SUSE Manager but are not using anything else SUSE. We don't particularly like that, but we do. So just to go back a little bit, SUSE Manager pulls in the SCAP protocols, the SCAP checklists, and can validate your systems using the OpenSCAP technology through SUSE Manager. We pull in the CVE checklist for common vulnerabilities, and we can check against your systems and provide those patches. And then Prometheus is a real-time monitoring solution that allows you to use that data, real-time data, to create Grafana dashboards that are graphical that you can share with your CIOs, your directors, your CISOs, et cetera. And I just want to go through a quick um, case study. Office Depot is one of our customers. They are a leading provider of business services. They have merged with other companies. I think the most recent merger was with Office Max. And they were going through a lot of challenges because of all the mergers and acquisitions and the different infrastructures coming in, they were seeing an increase in cyber attacks. They also needed to minimize the cost of management and security. They wanted their people to do more interesting things, more business oriented things. 
and they were just really wanting to get to a cloud first strategy. So they brought SUS in. They were, they were able to save more than 40% in their IT management costs with the combination of SUSE Linux and SUSE Manager. They were able to automate their processes for patch management, get themselves on a regular patch schedule, and just basically really simplify their data management. And their, their engineers are now doing things that are innovative for the business. And with that, I want to thank you and ask for any questions. So thank you guys. We are out of time, but we will be here around until Friday. We are in the sponsor showcase. Yep. If you have any further questions, happy to talk. Just reach out. Thank you very much.